this lecture we will continue our discussion on factor analysis. In the last lecture we had uh, given some preliminary introduction about factor analysis. We had also looked at uh, as an example if we have a covariance matrix sigma, how to verify whether a particular m order factor model holds for such a sigma matrix or not. We had also seen some important results concerning factor analysis. Uh, specifically, we had uh, these uh, remarks at the end of the example that remark 2 had uh, when we had said that if we take m equal to p, then sigma can always be written as uh, sigma equal to ll dash plus psi. Thus, an m factor model will always hold in such a situation. In the next remark, we had seen uh, how the reduction in the number of parameters uh, is affected when we have an m factor model. Now, let us look at the next important thing which goes as remark 4. Suppose m factor model holds for x and if x is rescaled that is if x is transformed to d x wherein this d is a diagonal matrix. Remember this is p by 1. So, this is a diagonal matrix d 1, d 2, d p. Then m factor model also holds for the rescaled variable that is y. So, we have got this d to be the diagonal matrix which is p by p order. So, the m factor model will also hold for y. Now, let us see why is that so. Now, this is what the remark says. Now, since m factor model holds for x, holds for x, we can write this x as x minus mu, where mu is the mean vector. This is equal to L f plus epsilon, where L is a loading matrix, f is a vector of m specific factors, uh, uh, I am sorry, f is a vector of m common factors and epsilon is a vector of p specific factors. So, this is what is the setup for the factor analysis. Now, if we pre multiply this equation uh, by this diagonal matrix D, what we get is that this D x minus D mu that is equal to D L f plus D epsilon. Now, this D x we had uh, earlier denoted by y. So, let that be equal to y and let us denote this D mu by nu that is equal to let us write this as d l f this write this as eta, wherein what we have used is this nu equal to d times mu and this eta vector is d times epsilon. Right? Now, this particular form here will represent, now this is an p by 1 dimensional random vector here. Now, this we can denote as some l star say that f plus eta. So, this looks as if it is an m factor model for this random vector y provided the assumptions that we had uh, usually in mind uh, for the factor analysis model holds. Now, the vector of the common factors remains exactly the same. So, this is m by 1 vector. Now, what is the order of this eta? Eta as it is defined, it is p by 1. Now, expectation of f of course, nothing has changed from the previous equation. This will be equal to a null vector. Then the covariance matrix of this f vector that would be an identity matrix, identity matrix of order m because this is the m factor model for the random vector x. Now, concerning this eta, expectation of this eta vector will be expectation of d times epsilon. So, that will be equal to a null vector. And furthermore, 
this covariance matrix of eta, this is equal to the covariance matrix of d times this epsilon vector. Now, epsilon as it is given here, this epsilon will have a covariance structure, covariance of epsilon equal to psi matrix, which is a diagonal matrix. That is what is the assumption for an m factor model. So, that we will have here as d psi matrix times d transpose. So, what would be the characteristics of this particular matrix? This matrix will also be a diagonal matrix as we have this d and also d prime which is exactly the same. So, they are diagonal matrix psi the starting matrix is a diagonal matrix and also we will have the covariance between f and eta. This would be covariance between f, f is unchanged. So, this is d epsilon. Now, expectation of f is equal to 0. So, this is equal to expectation of f epsilon transpose times this d tra transpose. Because this f and epsilon are coming from the original m factor model, we will have in this particular model furthermore that covariance between f and epsilon, this would be equal to a null matrix and hence this is what we will ha also have a null matrix. Thus, we see that if we are having an m factor model to hold for x, then if x is rescaled that is x is transformed to dx with d a diagonal matrix, uh, we have been able to write this y minus nu, nu is expectation vector of this y vector which is equal to L star f times eta, wherein this f and eta satisfies the required conditions for an m factor model to hold. So, this will imply that m factor model holds for y equal to dx. Right? Now, we will look at the next important remark. This would be remark number 5, which will say that L and F in an m factor model are not unique. That is, it states that uh, if we have a random vector x and we are looking at expressing that uh, random vector in terms of an m factor model, then this L is what is the matrix of factor loadings and F is the vector of our m common factors, the choice of L and F are not unique. Now, why do we say so? Let us try to understand what uh, we are trying to achieve. Suppose x, this is a p by 1, has m factor model or an m factor model holds for x, we will be able to write x minus mu to be equal to L f plus epsilon with the corresponding assumptions on f and epsilon to hold. Now, on the right hand side, if we introduce an orthogonal matrix gamma, gamma transpose, then nothing will change as such, wherein this gamma is such that it is an orthogonal matrix. So, that gamma, gamma transpose is equal to an identity matrix. Now, if we have this, we have this x minus mu written in terms of this. That is, in other words, we can write this x minus mu equal to L star wherein L star is L times gamma and this is say an F star vector where F star is this gamma prime F, this plus epsilon. So, we have a new loading here and this F star, the new vector, this is an m dimensional vector, it needs to satisfy the conditions in order to say, uh, in order that we can say that this is an m fac factor model for this random vector x. Now, there is no change in epsilon. So, this expectation of epsilon is still a null vector and the covariance matrix of epsilon is psi, the diagonal matrix which is coming from the previous uh, formulation. Now, this f star is such that f star is equal to gamma prime f vector. This is such that expectation of this f star 
will be equal to expectation of this gamma prime f this will be a null vector because this f uh, has got expectation as null vector then the covariance matrix of this f star will be equal to the covariance matrix of what we have defined is gamma prime f so this is gamma prime f this will be equal to gamma prime this will be equal to gamma prime then covariance matrix of f times gamma now covariance matrix of f because f is the vector of common factors coming from the m factor model so this is an identity matrix so this will be gamma prime gamma this will be an identity matrix right so this is what is concerning the covariance matrix of f and furthermore the covariance between this epsilon because epsilon is unchanged here so we need to look at the covariance matrix of epsilon and f star so covariance matrix of epsilon and f star this is equal to the covariance matrix of epsilon and this gamma prime f this is equal to expectation of epsilon f prime this would be an f prime f prime times this gamma matrix now the relationship between epsilon and f f is the vector of common factors in the original m factor model and hence we will have the covariance between epsilon and f to be equal to 0 and null matrix that multiplied by this gamma is also a null matrix so that if we have written this particular model as in here we are having f star such that expectation of f star is equal to 0 covariance matrix of f star is an identity matrix of order m and the covariance matrix of epsilon and f star that is equal to a null matrix epsilon of course is unchanged and hence that has got expectation equal to a null vector and covariance matrix diagonal psi matrix this will imply that this x minus mu equal to l star f star plus epsilon is an m factor model for x so what have we what are we trying to see we are trying to see that this is an m factor model for x with the loading matrix as l and the vector of common factors as f now the same can be expressed in terms of another l star where l star is just equal to l times gamma matrix where gamma is an orthogonal matrix so this also has this representation so we have a different loading matrix l star than the original starting l and we have a different uh, vector of common factors f star which is different from the starting f so the choice of l and f is definitely not unique now in order to make this particular choice of l and f unique the, some additional conditions are sometimes imposed uh, like the following condition some conditions are imposed so as to have the m factor model unique for example one such condition is that l prime psi inverse l to be a diagonal matrix so such additional conditions may be imposed on the model so as to have the choice of the l and the corresponding f vector to be unique now in the next remark which is remark number 6 which uh, remark number 6 talks about non existence non existence of 
proper solution for m factor models. Now, in some situations, suppose we start from a variance covariance matrix as in sigma, uh, we might get after the solution. Now, let me just write it sigma equal to L L dash plus psi is what would lead us to believing that an m factor model holds for the original set of random va uh, variables p dimensional x. Now, in some situations starting from a sigma matrix, we might still be able to solve this particular equation, but we might be getting psi i's. So, if we have psi i's negative, then the solution is not a proper solution. Why do we say so? What are psi i's? Psi i's are the specific variances. So, those are the variances of specific factors. Now, they cannot be negative and hence if in some situation by solving such an equation in order to verify whether an m factor model holds for x, if we get in the solution that psi i's are negative, then the solution is not a proper solution. Now, such a situation is referred to as the Haywood case. So, the Haywood case basically tells us that in order to get this solution, if we get psi i is negative, that solution is not a proper solution and uh, the terminology that is used in order to um, actually say such a case, you will say that it has some property like what is called the Haywood case. Right? Let us look at an example of such an Haywood case, where this proper solution will not exist. So, we take a sigma matrix which is 3 by 3 matrix, which is having 1 in the diagonal. So, it is basically uh, variance covariance matrix of standardized variables and we take the following values 0 0.9, 0 0.7 and 0 0.4. So, this is the starting covariance matrix. We are trying to see to check whether one factor model holds for the random vector x, which has this as the covariance matrix. Right? Now, in order to do that, we need to frame the following equation, which says that sigma equal to L L dash plus psi, where this L is going to be equal to, because we are saying that whether a one factor model holds. So, this is L 1 1, L 2 1, L 3 1 and this psi is the diagonal matrix with psi 1, psi 2 and psi 3 as the 3 diagonal entries. Now, if we plug in this particular value, we will have this sigma equal to our L 1 1, L 2 1, L 3 1 that into its transpose. So, it is L 1 1, L 2 1, L 3 1 this plus this psi matrix. So, we will have this sigma to be equal to if we look at this particular multiplication and then add the psi matrix to that multiplied vector, what we will be getting is L 1 1 square plus psi 1 on the 1 1 th element, L 1 1, L 2 1, L 1 1, L 3 1, this is L 2 1 square plus psi 2 and this is L 2 1, L 3 1 and the 3 three th element is L 3 1 square plus psi 3. Now, we know what is this particular sigma matrix. So, equating what we get is the following 1 equal to L 1 1 square plus psi 1, because the 1 1 th entry of this sigma matrix is equal to 1. The other values also gives us the following that 0 0.90 is equal to your L 1 1, L 2 1. Then we have the value as 0 0.70 that is equal to L 1 1, L 3 1. This entry L 2 1 square plus psi 2, this is equal to 1 and L 2 1, L 3 1, that is equal to the given value which is 0 
four zero and we have this L three one square plus psi three that is also equal to one. So, we need to solve this particular set here and then come up with the values of L 1 1, L 2 1, L 3 1 and psi 1, psi 2 and psi 3. Now, if we use first these two equations, this L 1 1, L 3 1 that is equal to 0.7 and L 2 1, L 3 1 that is equal to 0.4. So, this will imply because L 3 1 is common out here, we will have this L 2 1 equal to 0.4 by 0.7 times L 1 1 right. And furthermore, what we have from this equation is 0.9 equal to L 1 1 times L 2 1. So, these two collectively would imply or rather give us the solutions. This will lead us to L 1 1 square that is equal to 1.575 that is L 1 1 will be equal to plus or minus the square root of this particular number which turns out to be 1.255. Right. So, we have a solution L 1 1 equal to this. Now, we will see why this is not a feasible solution. Now, realize that this variance of x 1 is equal to sigma 1 1. What is that equal to? From the given sigma matrix that is equal to 1. So, this is equal to 1 which is also equal to when we are looking at this variance of the first common factor L 1 1 is the loading of x 1 on f 1. Now, the two component x 1 and f 1 both of them have variance equal to 1 and what we have seen earlier is that this L i j is the covariance between x i and f j. So, this L 1 1 is nothing but covariance between x 1 and f 1 since the variances of x 1 and f 1 are both equal to 1, we will have this as also the correlation between x 1 and f 1. Now, the solution what we have got is L 1 1 equal to plus or minus 1.22 which is an absurd value. So, this will imply that L 1 1 equal to plus or minus 1.255 is an absurd value. So, if we have this lambda m plus 1 to up to lambda p close to 0, we can neglect the contribution of these eigenvalues lambda m plus 1 to lambda p to sigma. That is in the spectral decomposition as in here, we have from lambda 1 to up to lambda p we are assuming that beyond a certain point m, lambda m plus 1 to up to lambda p are negligible, they are close to 0 and hence we can neglect the contribution of these terms, the last uh, p minus m terms and then we can say that let in such a situation sigma is approximately equal to our first m terms that is lambda 1 e 1 e 1 prime plus lambda m e m e m prime. Now, we can write this particular expression here up to m terms. This is approximate because we have chopped off from lambda m plus 1 to up to lambda p those contributions. So, we can write similar to the previous setup that this is equal to root over this root over lambda m e m and this is the transpose of it lambda 1 e 1 prime root over lambda m e m prime. Right? So, if sigma is approximately equal to this, we can take the variance of the specific factors, variance of the specific factors can be taken as diagonal entries of sigma. Now, we will write this as L L dash where this L matrix is this particular matrix which is P by M. 
So, this matrix is what we are writing as p by m, this is m by p, it is transpose by choosing the diagonal entries of sigma minus l l dash. That is what we are having is this psi i equal to sigma i i minus this l i j square for j equal to 1 to up to m. So, we will look at this sigma minus this l l transpose and then from that difference matrix if we pick up just the diagonal elements and then say that our psi i's are going to be that sigma i i this sigma i i is the diagonal entry of this and this quantity is l l dashes diagonal quantity i th diagonal quantity and this will imply that we will have this sigma approximately equal to l l dash plus the psi matrix wherein using these psi's here we will form the psi matrix which is psi 1 psi 2 and psi p the specific variances all these quantities are zeros right now in this approximation note that the diagonal entries of sigma would exactly match with the diagonal entries of l l dash plus psi because l l dash is up to this particular uh, term e m or lambda m terms and psi is what we are taking as the diagonal entries of this particular difference matrix and hence this sigma being approximated by l l dash plus psi this approximation in this approximation the diagonal entries will be exactly equal to 0 and the off diagonal entries of sigma and l l dash plus psi will differ. Now, we will use this particular concept in order to estimate l and the corresponding uh, psi matrix from the data. So, what we will now look at is applying the above procedure above procedure to a given data set. Now, the data set is comprising of x 1. So, that is the first p dimensional realization x 2 this is the second p dimensional realization and this is say x n which is the nth p dimensional realization. So, these are the realizations which we have as the data set. So, for any practical purpose as such where we do not have any idea about what is the covariance matrix of the underlying random uh, variables we will just be having this x 1, x 2, x n as the given data set. Now, given this particular data set, we will apply the previous concept when we had looked at that sigma matrix and then give this algorithm for actually estimation of uh, the loading matrix and the psi the matrix of specific factors variances. So, at the first step from this given data, we will compute I will just give this uh, step by step procedure. What we will first compute is the sample mean vector the observed sample mean vector given this is calculated we will calculate the deviation vectors deviation vectors are given by this x j minus x bar quantities. Now, using these deviation vectors or otherwise using the deviation vectors compute the uh, sample variance covariance matrix the sample variance covariance matrix say is given by this capital S. Now, once we have this, now this is going to be the estimate as such of the sigma the population variance covariance matrix. Now, we will compute the eigenvalue eigenvector pairs compute the eigenvalue eigenvector 
pairs of S, say those are given by lambda 1 hat E 1 hat lambda 2 hat E 2 hat and now this is a p dimensional uh, observations p dimensional observations n of them. So, the variance covariance matrix is also p dimensional and we will have these as the corresponding Eigen values and Eigen vector pairs. These are given caps because we had estimated sigma by s and we look at lambda 1 hat as an estimate of lambda 1 which was the Eigen value corresponding to the, the largest Eigen value corresponding to the sigma matrix. Now, here we will have similar uh, relationship between the lambda i hats. So, lambda 1 hat is greater than or equal to lambda 2 hat is greater than or equal to lambda p hat. Now, we will use these estimated eigenvalues and the corresponding estimated eigenvectors in order to. So, in the fifth step here, let us say that m less than p be the number of common factors that we are going to choose, then the matrix of factor loadings are estimated as this L hat, which is going to be equal to root over lambda 1 hat times this E 1 hat root over lambda 2 hat times E 2 hat and so on. This is root over lambda m hat, where m is the number of common factors that we are choosing and this is going to be this E m hat. Right? Now, why is this so? Because if we look at this formulation here, what we had chosen was this matrix truncated up to the m th point and since we are going to have the estimates from the uh, estimated uh, sample variance covariance matrix from just the sample variance covariance matrix and the Eigen value Eigen vector decomposition. If we are choosing m less than p to be the number of common factors, then the matrix of factor loadings are estimated by this. Now, once we have this factor loading matrix as this, the next step would be to estimate the specific variances. So, what we will have is the following the estimated specific variances, the estimated specific variances psi i hats are given by the diagonal entries of diagonal entries of which matrix? Now, it would be S minus L hat L hat transpose. Why is that so? Because in relationship with this particular relationship, we had chosen the variance of the specific factors as sigma minus L L dash. Now, sigma is estimated by S, L is estimated by L hat and hence we will be using uh, this S minus L hat L hat transpose, its diagonal entries will be chosen as the specific uh, as the estimates of the specific variances psi i. That is, we will have this psi i psi i hat will be equal to S i i, where S i i is the diagonal entry of this S matrix, this minus j equal to 1 2 up to m l i j hat squares, where l i j hat is the i j th element of this l hat matrix. Now, lastly, now that is what is the estimation, because l has been estimated as l hat corresponding to the m factor model and this uh, after this we will have this psi matrix to be estimated as psi hat matrix, which will have the entries as psi 1 hat, psi 2 hat and a psi p hat, rest of the elements are zeros, which is given by this.
with the last thing as a remark. The communalities the communalities are estimated as your h i hat square which is just this particular term because s i i is equal to communality plus the specific variance and hence this communalities for the different common factors are going to be given by l i hat square terms of this. right? So, this is how from a given data vector we will be able to estimate all the all the things which are required in order to actually have an m factor model for the given data. So, this is a stepwise procedure. Now, under such a situation we uh, make a note of the following facts. The first note says that for a principal component solution for a principal component solution the estimated factor loadings estimated factor loadings does not change as the number of factors are increased What it is trying to convey is the following message that suppose we have an m factor model, uh, we have estimated the factor loadings and the specific variances for an m factor model. If we want to go from an m factor model to an m plus 1 factor model, now the previous factor loadings, the factor loadings for the first m factors will not change if we are actually estimating the factor loadings and specific variances under this particular principal component solution approach. Now, why is that so? For example, just uh, look at a simple situation. Suppose we have an m factor model. If we have an m factor model, then this l hat matrix, say l 1 hat matrix, which this 1 signifies that it is a 1 factor model. This will be equal to what? This will be equal to root over lambda 1 hat times e 1 hat. Now, if we want to go from the first factor one factor model to a two factor model, so this is a two factor model that is m equal to 2. Now, the loading matrix for m equal to 2 will be given by root over lambda 1 hat e 1 hat still it is first column and the second column is just augmented that you will have this as lambda 2 hat e 2 hat. So, what we observe is that this was the factor loading matrix for a one component model and this is the factor loading matrix for a two component model that is m equal to 2. So, the two component model has two columns. This is the first column is the factor loadings corresponding to a one component model and hence it does not change when we are moving from a one factor model to a two factor model. In general, if we have m equal to k say then this L k hat matrix will have its entries as L 1 hat E 1 hat root over L uh, lambda k hat E k hat. Now, if from m equal to k we want to move, at, move ahead and uh, have a k plus 1 factor model for some reason, then what we will be having as this factor loading matrix for this k plus 1 dimensional factor model will just be this factor loading matrix corresponding to this k factor model. This will be augmented by one more column which is lambda k plus 1 hat times e k plus 1 hat. So, as such as we are seeing here that the factor the previous factor loadings are not going to change if we are moving from a lower order factor model say kth order factor model to a k plus 1 th order factor model. Now, when we are using this principal component uh, approach 
principal component method for estimation of L and psi, we are making some approximation as we have seen in here that we are going to approximate this L, uh, uh, this S in terms of L L hat, uh, this one, we will just write it here. This S is being approximated by L hat, L hat transpose plus this psi hat matrix. This is similar to the approximation that we had used for sigma matrix. So, this approximation is of what nature? If we look at the diagonal entries of S, they are going to match with the diagonal entries of this L hat, L hat transpose plus this psi hat matrix. Only the non off diagonal entries of the two matrices S and L hat, L hat transpose and psi are going to differ. So, the following result gives us a measure of closeness of approximation Now, what is this approximation? This approximation is that S we are approximating by L hat L hat transpose plus psi. Now, this is an important result which gives us the measure of closeness, some idea about the closeness of this approximation. If we denote by delta this difference matrix which is S minus L hat L hat transpose plus psi. So, this is this delta matrix is going to measure uh, the degree of closeness of this approximation. So, let us uh, denote this these elements as small delta i j's. Then this summation of delta i j square sum over i j which is also going to be equal to trace of this delta square matrix. This is a symmetric matrix this is going to be less than or equal to summation lambda i terms lambda i hat squares i equal to m plus 1 to up to p. So, what it says is that this delta matrix the matrix of differences comprising of delta i j as the i j th element of this delta matrix this sum of square of all these deviation matrix deviation matrix elements delta i j. So, this is the sum of square of all the deviations is going to be bounded by it is less than or equal to summation i equal to m plus 1 to up to p lambda i hat squares. Now, this summation is what? This summation is the contribution of lambda i hat squares for the remaining for, for the last p minus m eigenvalues. So, we had at the starting point said that this type of method is going to work well if we have the last p minus m eigenvalues to be negligible and hence in such a situation this approximation would be very close. In the next lecture, we will look at proving this particular result.